The epistle is taken from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15. Brethren, I make known unto you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, for which also you are saved. If you hold fast after the one manner I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and after that by the eleven. And he was seen by more than five hundred brethren at once, of whom many remain until this present, and some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And last of all he was seen by me, as one as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace in me hath not been void. Holy Gospel. Came that according to St. Mark chapter 7. At that time Jesus, going out of the coast of Tyre, came up by Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, to the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring to him one deaf and dumb, and they besought him that he would lay his hand upon him. And taking him from the multitude apart, he put his fingers into his ears, and spitting, he touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he groaned and said to him, Epheta, which is, Be thou open. And immediately his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke right. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more the great, a great deal did they publish it. And so much the more did they wonder, saying, He hath done all things well. He hath, bo he, hath both, he hath made both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. That's right, the words of the Holy Ghost. This Tuesday, August 15th, is the Feast of the Assumption of Our Lady, a holy day of obligation. The Mass that day will be 7 p.m., 7 p.m., August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption of Our Lady, Mass 7 p.m. <laughs> also at the beginning of the first week of September, September 1st, beginning is, uh, of course, first Friday, 7 p.m. Mass, but it also will be the Young Adult Gathering. It's an announcement for those uh, watching and so on. The Young Adult Gathering will be the September 1st, uh, beginning Friday, and uh, be that weekend. And he said to him, Epheta, which is, be thou opened. And immediately his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loose. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Your faithful, we have a few subjects today in this excellent epistle, in this excellent gospel to consider here from the fathers and from McEwen Callan to theologians, to Dominicans. Epheta, which is be thou opened. Of course, that's the time, the only time we use the Aramaic language when, when we do a baptism. We say to the little baby, Epheta, we take a little spit, and we say, Epheta, Epheta, which is be thou opened, and we uh, wipe the ears and the nostrils of the of the baby. It's the only time we use the Aramaic in the ceremonies. And I'll get to that, the ceremonies of the sacraments. That's one of our main points today, is the ceremonies of the sacraments. But notice also this beautiful epistle by St. Paul. St. Paul says all the times that our Lord was seen, he says, last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of due time. In Latin, it's abortivo. Abortivo, where we get the word abortion. St. Paul says, basically, he was an abortion. He was born out of due time. He shouldn't have been born. He was a persecutor of the church. Last Sunday, because it was taken over by the Transfiguration, we didn't get to see the Gospel, which was the Gospel of the Pharisee, the, 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 the Pharisee and the one and the publican praying. Remember that, that parable where the both were praying and the Pharisee was saying, thank you, God, that I am what I am, and I am not like these other sinners. For example, that guy over there, Thank God I'm not like him. And the publican, who was a sinner, was in the back of the church, wouldn't lift his eyes up, and struck his breast, saying, Have mercy on me, a sinner. And Christ said that he went home justified. For he that exalted himself shall be humbled, 
and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So even though you may be a great sinner, humility is the key virtue. That, that, that was, we didn't get to talk about that last Sunday because we had the great feast of the transfiguration. But the fathers say, look now to this Sunday. We learned last Sunday, or was going to, uh, the virtue of humility. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And now look at St. Paul. St. Paul was the greatest of all the apostles. And he says, for I am the least of the apostles. For I persecuted the church, and I am not worthy to be called an apostle. But he recognizes, and this is what true humility is, he recognizes where his strength is. I am not worthy to be an apostle, he says. For I persecuted the church, I was born out of due time. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am what I am. That's recognizing the truth. Humility is truth. There's such thing as false humility. And it's actually called pride. It's the opposite. It's false humility. Where we go around and we act humble. We consider ourselves too weak to do the things we're called to do. I can't become a saint. I can't fast that much. I'm too much of a sinner. I'm not going to aim for perfection like I should. I'll just aim to get to heaven. But I'm not going to aim to become a saint. I'm too big of a sinner. That's called false humility. And it's actually also a vice against fortitude. It's called pusillanimity. It's a vice against fortitude. Where we act as if we don't have the strength to do what we actually do have the strength to do. Because we're humble. St. Paul was not this kind of humble. He was truly humble. He said, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle, but I am one. And I am what I am by the grace of God. We recognize that we are capable of nothing. We can do nothing. But by the grace of God, all things are possible. Lord, who can be saved? He said, for men, it's impossible. But by the grace of God, nothing is impossible. He was the great apostle, the vessel of election, by the grace of God. And the grace of God had not been void in him. Let it not be void in us. Let us recognize that we are capable of nothing. We are weak. We are sinners. We're not worthy to be called anything. But sometimes we have duties of saints. And I'm not worthy to be called a priest or be a priest, but I am. You're not worthy to have children, but you do. You're not worthy to enter the church. Receive the Blessed Sacrament, but our Lord asks you to, by the grace of God. Let the grace of God not be void in you, and attribute all to the grace of God. I was actually listening to the Reverend Mr. Chanel. He was in the Philippines. He's got his white cassock on, and he's grown out his, his beard. And he was giving a sermon. I listened to part of it. It was quite good. He was giving a sermon there in the Philippines. I forget where they were, but I was talking with him on the phone, and it brings back a lot of memories. I've been there before, and he's talking about the places and things he's seeing and the food they're eating and, and it brought back good and bad memories. But he gave a sermon and he mentioned to attribute all to the grace of God. We are not capable of anything. Nothing is of ourselves. All good comes from God. To remember that humility. But to recognize that we are still called to do things and we still can even be great. That's called the virtue of magnanimity. It's the opposite virtue of pusillanimity. It's a virtue of fortitude. When we desire to do great things within our capability by the grace of God. That's a virtue. It's a virtue. Now back to the sacraments. A quick look. Because of this miracle that Christ performed, he didn't have to do it by external signs. He didn't have to touch the ears and spit and, and loosen the tongue. He didn't have to do that. God could have done it without doing any external signs. But he did it because we're men. Remember, we're men. We're made of body and soul. It's a lie that we're supposed to be all spiritual. A spiritualistic kind of religion. Where the material is bad. And kind of, if we, if we say that the spirit, as G.K. Chesterton says, if we say that the spirit must completely overrule the physical, follow it out, we lead into another type of error called Manichaeanism. Where we say that the sun is bad, therefore, and the moon is bad and created by the devil, and the things of this world are bad because they're material. And the spiritual must completely win, and he said it leads to the most absurd things, such as suicide, because it's killing of the body and only leading to a spiritual destination. Therefore, it's good. Or even perversions are good. 
is that it leads to an absurdity. So the spiritual is not to completely reign over the material. The spiritual, the supernatural, supernatural means above and upon. We don't have the supernatural life and the grace of God over here, up here, and we're all down here, where the two don't connect. And when I meet up on Sunday at Mass, we say hello to God at Mass, and we be spiritual at Mass. That's the wrong term, that's the wrong definition of the term spiritual. This idea that it's of, away from us and above us, and a supernatural was super, not meaning above, but upon, it rests upon. As Bishop Pfeiffer says, I love the quote, the supernatural has to be natural to us and the natural supernatural to us. We have to, we have to make the supernatural natural to us in the sense of the term that we have to make it according to we have to like breathing. It has to become one with us. It has to become natural to us, like a habit. And the natural has to become supernatural to us. That every day day to day tasks of the doing the dishes and the and the and the and the chores and the playing the games and the uh, beating the games and having fun and being competitive and so on, even those natural things become supernatural. But the natural becomes supernatural and the supernatural natural to you. But the supernatural rests upon the natural. They're one, they're connected. We cannot separate the two. And we don't live in a spiritual kind of spirituality that's completely outside the physical. So Christ did not have to use these external signs, but he did, because we're made of body and soul. That's why St. Thomas Aquinas says that when we worship God, religion, the virtue of religion, it truly, the definition is the inward devotion, the piety, and the reverence towards God, recognizing God as, giving, honoring him as his due, because he's God, the maker and the creator. But the virtue of religion also includes outside and public external worship. It's part, we study this in apologetics, why there must be ceremony, external ceremony. And it's for the simple reason that we're made of body and soul. God made us that way in the beginning. It's not like Adam and Eve sinned and then all of a sudden got a body. They were made with the body. The body is made to be perfected. The body is made to praise God. Everything is made to praise God. So externally, we must worship God with our voice and our gestures. And there must be ceremony. And God made the sacraments that way for men because sacraments are made for men. Not the other way around. around. Sacraments are made for men. And so they're external things. And this is one of the proofs of it. He didn't have to use, but he did. He touched the ears, and he's groaned, and he spit upon the ground, and loosed his tongue. He used these material things to perform a miracle. Obviously, God did not need to do that. He did for our own good. And therefore, also we learn that the sacraments, I've mentioned before already, but good to review. The sacraments are made spiritual, graces are given through a physical or a natural and external sign. A sacrament is a sign instituted by Christ to give grace. It's made up of two things, external, matter and form. In all the seven sacraments, there's matter and form. There's something external to them. Matter and form of the sacraments. As in baptism, there's water. We use water and we, the, that's the matter. And the form is the words used. The matter is the stuff. The oil, the water, and in confession, the sins, actually. And the form is the word spoken by the minister at the time of applying the matter. And you have a sacrament. An external sign instituted by Christ to give grace. He, by his divine will, instituted it this way. God can directly affect your souls and touch your souls, and he does. But it's by ordinary means of the sacraments. Because we have bodies, we live in society, we can't go in our rooms and lock the door and praise God that way. And that's not how God instituted it. Yes, we can, but not only. We were made a political animal to live together in society, to worship publicly, to use our members, and therefore signs. And that's how God ordinarily affects your soul and touches your soul with grace. It's through the sacraments. Now again, I've mentioned that the priest is the one who ministers the sacraments, but the priest has no power to touch your soul directly. He cannot touch it at all. So that's why the priest doesn't matter if it's your favorite priest, if you hate that priest, if that priest is stupid, if that priest is smart, it doesn't matter. The priest is just the instrument. He's like St. Thomas Aquinas says, the pipe that connects the faucet to where you want the water to go. He's just the in-between channel. He's the one who must say the words, the form of the sacrament, and use the matter 
to make a sacrament happen. He's the one that must be there. He's the messenger that takes the letter and delivers it to you. But whatever's written in there is between you and God. God's the one who only directly affects your soul. That's why the priest doesn't matter. And that's why they complained a lot about priests. I was just listening to a talk on my long drive at a funeral the other day. Again, drove up to New Jersey, had a funeral, and on the way I was with a couple of seminarians and listening to Father Hess and G.K. Chesterton and so on. Father Hess talks about if you get a problematic priest or you get a bad priest, just be careful with what you say about priests. To leave the judgment of priests to the clergy. Nowadays, we have a lot of problem priests. But that's not why we should, his point was, we're not, I don't want to go, I'm going to go off on so many subjects, but the quick point, his point was, we're not allowed to leave the Novus Ordo because we don't like it. We're not allowed to not go to a certain mass because we don't like the priest. We're not allowed to disobey our bishops because we don't like it. He said that's not sufficient reason, and it would be a mortal sin to do that. And he's right. It would be a mortal sin to not go to the Novus Ordo Mass every Sunday because we just don't like it. We, it has to be because we know and understand it's a matter of faith, because it's dangerous to our soul, and it's contrary to, to God's will for many different reasons, which is not the topic of this sermon. We have to understand it's not because we don't like it. So he's, and then he went on about priests. He said back then, if you were in Oklahoma, 1930s, in the middle of nowhere, and the next parish was 60 miles away, and you got a bad priest, it was tough luck. What are you going to do? You can't travel 60 miles. You can get your horse and, and buggy and drive there, I guess, but or your old car that you got to start up with the crank. Kind of like how my car sounds sometimes, you know. You could, but sometimes you got a priest that wasn't perfect, or that you just didn't like, or he didn't connect with you, he didn't understand you, or he didn't know how to help you personally, or he's lazy, or whatever. He said, "What do you do?" He said, "You pray for your priests. Leave the judgment of priests to the clergy. Pray for your priests because, as one cardinal put it, priests suffer." 10,000 times temptations in every one of the commandments. 10,000 more temptations than the faithful in every one of the commandments. They need prayers, not judgment. But God has instituted that men are to be the instruments of your sacraments, are to be the ones that carry the letter to you. They can't affect your soul directly. They don't care if he gives you bad advice in the confessional, if he says the wrong thing, if he misunderstood you, and and whatever, as long as he says, God then supplies the grace. The sacrament itself works. The grace worked. It's called ex opere operato. External signs. Now, there's an order to the sacraments. It's not stay too long on this subject. The sacraments themselves. There are an order to them. There's seven, as the fathers teach and the Council of Trent teaches. And they go along with the order of our life, as I've already mentioned before. Baptism, we're born. Holy Eucharist, we're nourished. Pens, we're healed. Matrimony is to the propagation of the human race. Order is government, that's the priesthood. And of course, extreme unction is strength or towards death and uh, confirmation as to adulthood. I think that's all seven. But they, uh, they, the point is, they still they match our states in life, our point that the, the, the life of a body. So do the sacraments match the life of the soul. Now, there is an importance to the sacraments. Some are more important than others. According to the intrinsic dignity of the sacraments, the most important, of course, is the Blessed Sacrament. That's our Lord himself, from which all other sacraments gain their efficacy, their grace. But according to the external, confirmation and holy orders are the most excellent, being only able to be conferred on by a bishop. And according to the end, marriage is the most sacred, and unification, because it represents the unity between Christ and his church, between a man and a woman. So it signifies the most important thing. Each sac and according, according to its importance, baptism and confession are the most important, they're the most excellent. So all the sacraments have a place. But remember, Christ instituted them, the external signs, instituted by Christ to give grace. There must be that as Christ spit, and he touched the ears, and he groaned. He didn't have to do that, but he instituted it that way. And that's how the sacraments work. Secondly, very quick points is to remember 
prayer. Remember prayer. And they bring to him one deaf and dumb, and they besought him that he would lay his hand upon him. They brought to Christ one deaf and dumb, and he asked to be healed of his physical ailments. So remember with prayer, yes, there's an order to prayer. We are to pray for only those things we're lawfully allowed to desire. But we're allowed to pray for even bodily welfare. We're allowed to pray for physical goods. We're allowed to pray for positions. We're allowed to pray for those things. But whenever you pray for something physical, a job or a promotion, or because you need money, or because of this or that, remember it always has to be an order in reference to the end, which is the spiritual. That's why when you pray for those things, it's on condition. I pray that I get this job, or I get this position, or so on and so forth. I pray that in, it's on condition that it's for the greater glory of God and the good of my soul. Now to pray for the honor and glory of God or for the salvation of our soul, you pray for that absolutely, because it will be heard. That you can pray for without condition, because that's something good, we should all be praying for. But to pray for something physical or for something temporal, you're allowed to, in as long as it is subordinate to your other ends, which is the spiritual. I want this, this, or this position, or this whatever, as long as it's in reference to the glory of God and salvation of my own soul. It's on condition. We're also to pray for, who are we to pray for? Remember this point, we're to pray for, in two ways, petition and thanksgiving. Petition, first of all, for all men, enemies, friends alike. We're to pray for all men. And there's an order to that, of course, we should pray first for our pastors, our priests, our bishops, and our pope. We should pray for them first. They need it the most. We should pray for our friends and benefactors, and also our, 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 our family, and, our, and then also our enemies, and the people especially we don't like. It's actually a very good and holy thing to pray for those you don't like. Like St. Teresa. She spent her recreation with the sister she disliked most. And that poor sister thought that St. Teresa was her best friend and liked her most. It was a great act of virtue. So spend time with those and pray for those you don't like most or even dislike. Who are we to pray to? Of course, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Blessed Trinity, the Blessed Virgin Mary, secondly, and then the saints and friends of God, especially our patron saint and our guardian angel. And this gospel shows those who say we can't or shouldn't pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary and to the other saints, it's a waste of time, go straight to God. This gospel shows, and they besought him that he would lay his hands upon him, that Christ doesn't take the intercession of saints, that Christ doesn't listen to the saints, that it's wrong to pray to the saints. No, this gospel says they besought him that they would lay his hand upon him, and Christ worked a miracle because sinners asked. A group of sinners came to him and asked, help this man, he's deaf and dumb. And he performed a miracle, and he cured him. Now, imagine when Christ is asked by his own friends who aren't sinners and who are in heaven. The intercession of the saints is very powerful. We pray to God for the grace to do the things we need and to help us, and we pray to the saints that they would join us in our prayer for God that they would intercede for us, just as any of us can intercede for each other. And just as sinners brought him, brought the man to Christ, and Christ performed a miracle because they asked. It's called intercession in the gospel. Protestants are supposed to know that. They're supposed to read the gospel. And lastly, St. Alphonsus. This subject today is on ill-speaking. Or, in other words, bad jokes, impure talk. Because he says that Christ went and he loosed the tongue. The string of the tongue was loosed and he spoke right. And he spoke right. Nowadays, people don't speak right. And how? The problem is, with the tongue, St. Alphonsus puts it this way. You can kill a man, murder him, <coughs> and you've just murdered a man. That's bad. Negative. 
moral sin. You'd probably go to jail. Not very happy. But it's one man. He says, but dear faithful, we're, remember the supernatural and the natural were together. If we think of the bigger picture, it would make sense to us that to say something evil or an impure joke or to say something obscene and five people listen and it kills five souls, that's worse than murder. It is worse than murder. Sometimes it strikes us like, how? How is that possible? In the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. You know the most serious sin in that commandment is not murder. It's scandal. And how often is that committed? You think, well, that's just not, that's just not a big deal. You can commit to somebody, I can, you know, scandalize someone, but they can go to confession. They can be forgiven. At least they're not dead. They have a chance. They committed, so they're probably going to commit a mortal sin anyway. What's the, what's the bad thing if I, if I teach them? Scandal is the worst sin you commit against the fifth commandment. Because it's the murdering of the soul. First of all, it's a higher being. So it's a worse act. It's a worse sin. Secondly, is this. St. Alphonsus gave the example of a pure young virgin who heard an impure or obscene word from a young boy. And because of it, she had an impure thought. And because of that, she gave her life away and fell into the sin of impurity. And it was said of her by one saint that she committed so many sins of impurity that if the devil himself took on flesh, she couldn't have committed more. It would be better if that boy just killed her. To speak of impurity or to say obscene things or improper things while others are listening, Saint uh, Jerome says that what is spoken about must necessarily be taken delight in. Otherwise, you don't speak about it. You don't talk about things you don't like to talk about. Well, unless you want to talk about bad about someone. But that's because you like talking bad about them. Either way, there's some kind of complacency there. So when others, when, when someone speaks evil or speaks improperly, necessarily, unless you pin up your ears, as the point at the conclusion of this, those who listen take complacency. Those who take complacency have somewhat of a desire. You're not allowed to desire that which you cannot have. And that complacency leads to a thought and a desire and therefore into an action. St. Jerome and St. Alphonsus, he, in giving his sermon, I was reading it, he emphasizes this point extremely. Those who say things evil, those who listen, I mean, to those things evil, they take a complacency and almost necessarily lead to thought and action afterwards. That's the problem, the evil of the tongue. It says that the uh, scripture says, the evil, I forget how it puts it. The evil, I forget the way it says it, but it says one evil is like a slash to the flesh, but the evil of the tongue is a breaking of the bones. Because the evil words spoken ruin a soul. And there's many examples. There's another example St. Alphonsus gives of a young boy, he was a very good boy, he was going to the monastery to study, and he had gone, I think he was already in the monastery, excellent young man, of good character, went into a carpenter shop, and there he heard an obscene joke or an obscene thing said, left, didn't think about it. Later that night, it came to his mind and he thought about it, and he died after thinking about it. The confessor, his confessor, found he died, he didn't know about the story, went to say mass for him the next day. The boy appeared to him and said, don't say mass for me, I am damned because of this. And he related the story. And he said, if you say mass to me, it'll just make it worse for me. And he disappeared. It was a story of a saint, saint, pardon my forgetfulness of the names, I forget his name, saint, uh, that'll come to me later. He went and he said that uh, he went to a home to warm himself. It was very cold, and he went into a home, and there was two old men sitting and talking about obscene things, improper things. And he chastised them and said, don't do it, and they ignored him. Shush. We're, we're fine. We're experienced. It doesn't bother us. The account is that after he chastised him and they didn't listen, one went blind and one died. So that's why you always want to listen to a saint when he gets angry. Mm -hmm. Careful. Never disregard what a holy person when they're mad has to say. A meek man when he's angry is serious. So this saint got very angry and they didn't listen. 
and therefore we're punished by it. They have the grace, you know. It's a danger to the souls around you. Watch what you say. Watch your words. Think before you speak. And if those things come to mind, suppress them. Don't say them. There's more damage done words to people that listen than many other sins. Now, the eyes for us, personally, individually, for ourselves, they bring in the most sins. They're the windows to the soul, as our Lord says. They bring in the most sin for us. But the tongue brings out the most sin, scandalizes the most. We can make others commit sin the most by our tongues, by our words. We have to guard our own eyes to protect ourselves. We have to watch what we say to protect others. St. Alphonsus rants and goes on and on and on about the dangers of speaking ill, of speaking improperly. He said the scandals that ensue, the souls that are lost, the holy that are become that become unholy. He, he, he just can't stop. He's, you can see it in, his, in the way it's written. But you can imagine how he was speaking it. He was trying to convey to the people the danger. And now he says, so many say, oh, I don't mean evil by it. It's a joke. He says that. And guess how many people say that nowadays? How often is that said? I don't mean evil by it. I'm not trying to scandal. It's a joke. It's a joke. I don't mean malice. Let's joke. St. Alphonsus says, you fool. The only one laughing at that joke is the devil. And he's going to be laughing at it when you're in hell for all eternity. St. Alphonsus is not nice today. He's on fire. And he says, you fool will burn. How dare you call an offense against God just a simple joke and to not put it as so serious as it is. The only one laughing is the devil. And you're going to burn in hell for it. Because you scandalize the innocent. And especially young, the young, be careful with your words, your faithful. It's very dangerous and it's in the heart. And St. Alphonsus says, and people don't think to confess it. Because they think it's not a big deal, it's just a joke. It meant no harm by it. They've heard worse. Hmm. It's not how it works, it's really dangerous. And it causes many sins, and many are scandalized by it. And it affects your soul as well. It affects your soul as well. The scripture warns about the evil tongue. Many times, especially in the, uh, the Sapienter books, books of wisdom, warns about the evil tongue, the damage it does to the souls of others and to your own. Mind what you say. And then lastly, St. Alphonsus says, if you're around those who speak evil, leave. Go away. Don't be friends with them. Stop them in their tracks because it says in Scripture, Again, paraphrasing, the scripture says, with those who speak evil, stop up your ears with thorns. Stop up your ears. Do not listen. Do not listen. The danger to your soul is too great. Because thoughts cause complacency, complacency cause a desire to think about it. And thinking about that which is unlawful leads to action which is wrong, sinful. The one thing leads to another. And so on and so forth. St. Jerome, St. Alphonsus. If you hear others speaking evil or improperly, stop up your ears with thorns. Walk away. Go away. And if you can't physically walk away, turn your face. St. Alphonsus says, let them know that you hate that kind of speech. Don't be afraid. Let them know that you hate that kind of speech. You will not tolerate it, and you will walk away from it. You won't be their friend anymore. They don't want it. You don't want to hear it. It's not to be in your set in your company. And that includes both improper speech and bad words and, and, all, and blasphemies and taking the name of God in vain. No, I do not have part in that. I don't want to hear it, and it's not going to be said in my presence. And if you're going to continue, I'm going to leave. I will not be part of this. St. So Alphonsus says, don't be afraid to stop up your ears and ashamed to be a soldier of Christ. Don't be afraid to be a follower of Christ. Why are you scared? You want that friend more than you want to be a friend of Christ? Go, go to hell with them. You don't want to offend that person because you care about their feelings? What about God? You're embarrassed and you don't want to be looked upon as some kind of sissy or some kind of holy woolly or think you're better than everyone else? You're worried about the judgment of man? What about God? Don't be afraid to stand up and be seen as a friend of Christ. St. Alphonsus says, lest 
If you're ashamed to stop up your ears, turn away from the conversation, change the conversation, leave. If you be ashamed and afraid to be a follower of Christ because of what others might think of you, he says, if you are do, he said, don't do that. Lest on the day of judgment, Christ be ashamed to let you into his kingdom. Because he doesn't want to have a part with you. You are ashamed to confess him before men. You are ashamed to tell someone to stop. You are ashamed because of, of, of human judgment, human respect. You are ashamed to be a follower of Christ. The day of judgment will come and he will be ashamed of you. Don't be ashamed to be a follower of Christ, lest he be ashamed to let you into his kingdom. So remember those few things, dear faithful, many things to consider. Beautiful, sir, uh, uh, beautiful epistle and uh, gospel to contemplate today. But those few things, remember with prayer, how, what to pray for and in what order. And remember we are to pray to the saints, we are to pray to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost first. And remember, we can pray for other things, worldly things even, as long as it's in order in reference to our higher end, which is God. Remember the sacraments, the most useful and necessary and ordinary means of grace given by weak men, such as us priests. But they are the ordinary means of grace for your souls to never have a disdain or let them become ordinary to you. God has created ceremonies and external rites for the purpose of us. We have bodies and they're good for us to see. That's why the sacraments have before and after, like the Mass and the other sacraments, they have prayers before, prayers after. They have what's called ceremonies because they excite in us faith and charity and so on. Never get used to or let the sacraments become commonplace to you. Never let them become commonplace. I go to confession every week. I go to Blessed Sacrament. go to communion. Uh, it's, it's normal for me. I'm used to it. Don't let the sacraments become ordinary or commonplace to you. They are great works of God, working grace in our souls. By external means, yes, they're external. There's uh, physical things, water, oil, and so on, but they're inwardly working grace. Never let them become common. And then lastly, remember your voice and what you say, how you speak. And the St. Alfonso says, too, remember, you know, watching what you say because you receive in that same mouth God himself. And what a contradiction. To receive God in the, the uh, communion rail and then to go and offend God with that same mouth and scandalize souls and bring the souls to hell with you. Remember those things, and don't be ashamed to be a father of Christ, lest it be ashamed to let you into his kingdom. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.